information, what's one of the four pillars that we'll need? Faith. Okay. Faith. Good. Another one. Time. So we have faith. Some kind of scripture. Creator. You need a creator. You need time. You need faith. And then there's its the second <coughs> column. The word of God. No. <laughs> well, you need the you need the word of God, yes. If you if you believe Jesus. in creation, but they don't need that in evolution. You need oh, Jesus if you right. We're talking about evolution. No, we're talking about the four pillars for each side. You need a creator. A process? You need the process. How were things created? Was it spoken into existence or was it naturalistic? Uh, like Devin said, you need the amount of time, okay? 13.8 billion years or six days. And again, uh, I believe Andrew was the one that said this. In order for you to believe either or, you have to have faith. You didn't see singularity explode. You could just assume it. So you believe that in uh, by faith. You didn't see God create the world in six days. You have to assume it, so you have to be you believe it through faith. Um, like I said last week, not today, but last week we looked at a creation and we studied exactly what biblical creation was. One of the first things we said was biblical creation is that supernatural conception. It's not a naturalistic conception. Uh, it's, it's supernatural in the essence that God is the one who created everything. Uh, not only that, we also, when we study biblical creation, we also believe that God <coughs> spoke things into existence and he created everything ex nihilo, which means out of nothing. Uh, there wasn't pre-existing matter. There wasn't matter that already existed that God used to just kind of meld animals and meld the fowl of the air and the beasts of the sea and every creeping thing on the earth and, and man in his own image. God didn't need the elements around because there wasn't any element. God said that there'd be light, boom, there was light. How did he create it? Spoke it into existence and that's that. God said, let's create man in our image, boom, that was taken care of. He didn't need, he didn't need billions and billions of years He created everything out of nothing. Now again, we also looked at why do we study biblical creation? One of the first reasons is it gives us the create or the identity of the creator. In the beginning, God. All right, so we already have a character in the fourth word of the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Uh, secondly, it teaches us the order of how things were uh, created. Now this is important with one of the compromising theories that we're going to take a look at today. It's very important. In Genesis 1, the Bible is very detailed on how things were actually created. How things were actually made in the order that they were made. It's very specific, very detailed, and you can't ignore it and you can't argue it. Yet, somehow, people are going to find their way to try to ignore it and argue it and come up with some other <coughs> definition. And we'll take a look at that later. Uh, biblical creation gives an identity to man. Evolution says man is an accident. You're an accident, you're just another animal that evolved from some other animal. You're not that big of a deal. You came from nothing, you're gonna die into nothing, and no one's really gonna remember you after hundreds of years. Where God has given man an identity. Uh, and lastly, if you study the origins account, uh, biblical creation gives us a need for a savior. Man was created in Genesis 1, man fell in Genesis 2, and there's a promise of a savior that we find in Genesis 3 verse 15. So again, we have the six days of creation. The first day, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. He also created light. He said, let there be light. And the second day, now, let me go ahead and just uh, put this out here. Let me go ahead and put this out here. This is not me practicing thug talk or ebonics, okay? I, I got this from Google. I didn't make this. Um, this says, if you can't see it, this says, God said there be a dome. Um, I didn't do that. That's not me. I got it from Google. Okay, um, I didn't create it. If I created it, I like to animate things. So I, I, I thoroughly enjoy animation. I did not make that mistake, though. Um, so I believe the word that was supposed to be there is let. And so God said, let there be a dome. The word the Bible uses is firmament. Uh, we see in verse 2, the, word, the earth is without form and void. So the idea of firmament means expanse. Uh, we, would, <clears throat> excuse me, we would think of that as an atmospheric expanse. So that's what God created in the second day and the third day. God made the land, separated the waters from the land. He called the land earth. He called the groups of waters seas. Uh, 
Day number four. God created the greater light to rule the day. You and I know that as the sun. Uh, the lesser light to rule the night. You and I would know that as the moon. And also, God created the stars. Uh, verse, or excuse me, day number five of creation. God made the fowl of the air and the beasts of the sea. Fowl of the air, you and I would know that as birds. Uh, beasts of the sea, we would know that as the fish or the whales or anything like that, that I mean, living thing that is in the sea. And then, of course, day number six is where I and you come into existence alongside <laughs> with every other land uh, animal. <laughs> with every other land animal, um, we see that created in verse, or excuse me, day number six. So, again, the four pillars of creation, we have evolution and we have creation. Uh, the creator for evolution is singularity. The process is the Big Bang, origin, and then a naturalistic process. Um, we have time. The time is 13.8 billion years. And by the way, we're still counting. It's not over yet. Evolution has not ended. Evolution has con is continuing and will continue until it no, until it no more exists. And then the faith aspect, if you're going to have faith in evolution, you have to believe in man, and then you have to believe in science. Um, man's version of science. Uh, that man, a lot of people would credit to a Darwinian evolution or Charles Darwin, where in his own book he says that this is just kind of a theory. If they're at the end of Origins of Species, he doesn't give any true credibility to it. He leaves it up for de uh, open debate. But he makes another book right afterwards, and this is why evolutionists really like to use him um, but you would have to have faith in man, and you have to have faith in science. Creation, the creator, we have God. Now, I did fix it. It's not existence, okay? It's existence now. I did make that mistake. That was just my uh, unintelligence there. But God spoke everything into existence. Um, it was supernatural, and we believe it was out of nothing. That was the process of creation. It did take six days, and then if you want to have faith into this, you have to have faith in God and science. And this would be science that would back up creation, which exists as well. So, now today, we're in a different topic. This is theistic evolution. Again, there are compromises or there are theories out there that say evolution is right and God is right. And what they'll try to do is they'll try to take these puzzle pieces and these factors and these, these things and try to pull from here and pull from there and create a theory that kind of makes uh, everyone a little happy. I mean, okay, evolutionists, you can't be terribly wrong. You're doing all this work and all these scientific experiments. I'm not smart enough to think through these scientific experiments, so I'm just going to trust your work. But, but we know God's real because he says so in his word. So what we'll do is we will try to combine the two. The ethnic evolution, outside of the creation account, is the most believed compromising theory in Christianity today. Statistically, more people will believe in theistic evolution than the other theories that we're going to study, and it's actually relatively close to the actual biblical account in regards to how many people believe it. Uh, this is literally being taught. I've been in churches to where theistic evolution is taught as fact that God is using the naturalistic process to create everything that we, say today, or that we see today. And by the way, this is what I believed for the majority of my life until I was about 21 years old. I thought theistic evolution was fact. Again, yeah, grew up in a public school system. All I was taught was evolution. I didn't really have a, a creation class in school, per se, or excuse me, um, in, in, in Sunday school or children's church, so I just knew God was real, and it seemed to be so many facts to support evolution, so I just thought God was using evolution to create uh, the world as we see it. So, but then again, that was until I was age 21, it was my junior year at Pensacola Christian College, took origins class, and it literally answered every question that I had, because if you really study this, things just actually don't add up. And if you think things through, which is what we're going to attempt to do today, if you think things through, you're literally trying to take a circle and put it in a triangular piece. It's not going to fit. So, what does theistic evolution teach? One of the things that theistic evolution teaches is that every single evolutionary and naturalistic process that's ever been discovered is 100% irrefutable. It's basically 
true, and it's been proven through science. So, the theistic evolutionists will say, I understand what Genesis 1 says, but science is absolutely true. We can't ignore the science that we find through these evolutionary studies. 13.8 uh, billion years seems to make a little more sense than six days. Um, you know, I, I think all these science or this naturalistic process tends to make more sense than ex nihilo. So, evolution is fact that we can that we can test through observable or historical science. Again, observable something you can test makes noise. Historical science is a document that you can um, refer to as truth. Now, again, they will say that everything about evolution is 100% true. It's not a lie. It's not, it's not a figment of our imagination, and it's not something that can be proven wrong. So, again, who was, what was the creator of um, what was the creator of evolution? What was the starting point of evolution? Some guy back in the 17th. No, 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 no. Big Bang. Big Bang. Oh. Big Bang. What was the first thing? Singularity. Singularity. Okay, the dot. So, again, we talked about this last week. One of the common questions with singularity is who put singularity there? How did singularity exist? Well, evolutionists will go with the intelligent design theory that I was telling you about last week, and that's the idea of there had to have been some supernatural being or supernatural race or this group of people that exist in a fourth dimension that we can't necessarily prove that a piece of their universe or a piece of them kind of broke off and it spermiates into the universe that you and I know of today. But what theistic evolutionists would say, that singularity, it could not have existed perpetually. It could not have existed forever. So clearly it had to have been God that placed singularity there. Evolution, theistic evolution, literally says Everything about evolution is 100% true. Just God did it. God used uh, evolutionary processes to create the world that you and I see today. See today, And this is a very common theory in our world today. This is exactly what's being taught. This is something that is, amongst Christians, isn't really far out. But yet, if you, just, if you study it, you'll recognize how much it just doesn't add up and it just doesn't make sense. So, when we talk about theistic evolution, there's a question that always comes up. And I want to ask you guys this question. And I want to get your feedback. I want, I want you to kind of think of where I'm going. I want to hear exactly what you guys think about this question. The question that's always usually asked is, does God have the ability to create the universe through naturalistic process. Does God have the ability to create the universe through naturalistic process? Sure. Yes. Yeah. Does anyone here think no? I have an issue with the hypotheticals that are outside of the character of the, of the person. So, you know, I mean, you could answer that question. You say it would never be in God's character to do so, mm -hmm. to do anything that would not glorify him, and that certainly would not glorify him. Mm -hmm. So, you know, from that perspective, along with a lot of, like, doctrines that have a found, a lot, a lot of Bible doctrines, actually, foundation, the foundation is a premise of how we reason God would do if we begin with the premise that this is the kind of God that he is. Mm -hmm. So, he's not that kind of God, so... You know, right? That would that would not bring glory to him. So, you know, to say ability using the word ability, I don't. I think it's. I don't think it's an honest question. Sure. Uh, and and well, that's. What go do ahead. you mean by naturalistic processes? Are you talking about the naturalistic processes <coughs> defined by evolution? Correct. Okay, so then I would say no because those processes can't work. Right. <laughs> that that is also a good answer too. Draw um, a line through that. We're done. <laughs> <laughs> That's I, I. I really appreciate both of those answers, and and both of you are absolutely correct. The reason why I bring this up is number one, this has been asked of me a plethora of times in the public school system, in churches, and they'll say, "Does God have the ability 
to create the universe through naturalistic process? And just like the most of you, I also would answer yes, because God has the ability to do anything. God is not limited to anything. But I would tend to think that if God had the ability to create the world through naturalistic process by the way an evolutionist determines it, number one, I would feel that there would be scientific fact to prove that evolution is true and credible, or creditable, which there really isn't. It's just really just a stretch of your imagination if you want to come to it. And then B, I think God would really say so in his word. Um, so this is, pastor, pastor's dead on, this is a very misleading question, and it's misleading on purpose. Because if theistic evolutionists, if, if, if Christians can get you to just kind of budge, if they can say, if they can get you to say yes to this, then you just open a Pandora's box. You just open a box to where someone can now persuade you of the idea that theistic evolution is not far out because God does have the ability, or he is not limited to only creating creation through ex nihilo and through a supernatural process. The issue is, it's exactly what the Bible teaches. Uh, the problem is, it's, it's, like I said, it's, it's a trick question that's going to be asked on purpose because what they're trying to do is to kind of get you to break. And realistically, once you break, you can't kind of go back from that. And this is one of the issues that we're having a lot with just Christianity today that's just kind of compromising just to have this happy medium so that way we don't have to be argumentative about one side and try to support another side. We can just kind of live in this happy medium and you believe what you believe, I believe what I believe, this kind of acceptance thing. And hey, maybe, maybe we're both right. Maybe we're both okay, you know. You know, I know God is the creator, but maybe he did use naturalistic processes because he is God and he can do anything. You know, we do know that. So it's a gotcha question. I'm sorry? It's a gotcha question. It, it, it is a gotcha question. And it's done on purpose. Whenever we were talking, um, like I told you, I was I was taught this in high school, I was taught evolution in high school, but they presented the idea of creation. And they kind of presented the idea of this, okay, okay, class, this is evolution. Evolution, 13.8 billion years, naturalistic process, and look at all these fossils and carbon dating. This is the proof of it. Oh, and um, by the way, there's this theory of creation as well. Um, six days, God spoke, all, you know. So uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna split the class. This side of the class, you guys are gonna be the evolutionists. And then this side of the class, you guys are going to be the creationists, and you guys have a week to try to prove your theory and why your theory is right. And so, one year, I had this class for two years, so it was kind of the same thing. I didn't fail it, just one was a junior class and then one was a senior class, and we did the same thing in both classes. Um, but basically, what happened was, we would get into a debate, an organized debate, to where we would dispute with each other, and then our teacher would ask us questions. And our teacher, who says that he actually was a Christian, um, come to find out afterwards, he just believes in theistic evolution. And he always asked us the question, do you think God has the ability to create the world through naturalistic process? Not if he did, do you think God has the ability? And as a 17 year old, being taught four months of evolution, being taught four or five months of naturalistic process, saying, okay, well, we have all these scientific facts. God could have created the world through evolution. So the answer for me would be yes at the time. And just like Joel said, it's kind of a gotcha question. Because if you can admit to that, then what you do is you cannot take Genesis 1 literally. Yes, sir. There's a real hermeneutic, uh, a really important hermeneutic lesson in this. This is where all false doctrine comes from among Christians, among believers as well, because when you ask a, the wrong question, in other words, it's a dishonest question is the, is the way to understand it. The question is not honest, and when you're talking with somebody or having a dialogue with somebody, this is where they get really, really, answer the question, answer the question, answer the question, and, and you have to say, you have to understand how to say the question is not honest. 
you know, and you have to be able to articulate, it is outside the character of God to do that. Right. And so there, there is no yes and no answer to the question. And this is, I mean, any doctrinal, any uh, false doctrine uses same question, different words for its premise. And then it fuses human reasoning and logic to follow on the basis of a flawed premise. Mm -hmm. And so as believers, if we could learn to think critically enough and analytically enough to realize that if I'm uncomfortable with a question, then the things I'm uncomfortable uncomfortable with need to, in other words, there's not one sentence that solves creation and evolution. You know, you can't solve it in one sentence. So somebody says that you have to accept a one sentence premise that's outside of faith. Uh, but then this reminds us about the importance of God's Word and of preservation and of absolute accuracy and then of ultimate authority and submission to the same. So anyway, that's, I mean, it, this is not this just this question. This is life, mm -hmm. and especially as a believer. And this is why Christians can't agree on alcohol. Mm -hmm. It's why Christians right. can't agree on you know, the sovereignty of God and the free will of man. That's why Christians can't agree on... I mean, you could just go through list after list after list after list. The mode of baptism. The, you know, everything you believe, the false doctrines come from the false premise. Absolutely. I, I would 100% agree with that. And I actually thank you for elaborating on that point because that's the point that I was trying to make. For the for the for the realm of false doctrine, if they can just get you to doubt or to change your answer or to think of another way that it could be a possibility, what you've done is you've opened another avenue for someone to come and teach you something that's incorrect, and that's exactly how theistic evolution is widely popular today. It, it, it's it's it will blow your mind if you haven't been exposed to it already. It will blow your mind how many Christians will actually say yes to this answer and because they can say yes, or excuse me, yes to this question, and because they can say yes to this question, then everything else that's going to follow it is a strong possibility and could be true. Any logical progression is only as good as its foundation or premise. Mm -hmm. So if the foundation's wrong, there is nothing, I mean, your, your conclusion will absolutely be wrong. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you, you have to have the same source of truth here. So, uh, just like Pastor said, this is an unintelligent question. Uh, the question that we shouldn't be asking is, does God have the ability to create the world through naturalistic pro uh, process? The question that we should be asking is, did God create the universe through naturalistic process? That's the question that we ought to ask ourselves uh, if, if we want to toy with the idea of theistic evolution. So, if we ask that question... In order for us to get the answer, we might want to go to the Creator. Um, when I worked at Four Winds, and for those of you who didn't go to Pensacola Christian College, it's, that's the uh, um, all-you-can-eat buffet cafeteria place. Um, when I worked there, I worked as a cook and a server, and I was always interested with how people could cook things uh, for 4,500 students, 400 uh, staff or faculty members, and about eight, 900 staff members. I always thought that was fascinating. One of my favorite things to eat at Four Winds was oatmeal raisin cookies. Uh, I love oatmeal raisin cookies over chocolate chip any single day. And I've lost friends over this. Uh, but I think oatmeal raisin cookies are... You're wrong about so pie, too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, pie doesn't matter. Um, I love oatmeal raisin cookies. I thought Four Winds oatmeal raisin cookies were absolutely remarkable. And I was really interested in how in the world could we uh, create such a delicious treat? And I wanted to figure out how we could make oatmeal raisin cookies. So how do I figure that out? It would make no sense for me to go to the grounds director or the lawn care director and ask him how we make oatmeal raisin cookies. It would make no sense for me to go to a maintenance person and ask um, how to make cookies. It makes no sense to go to my financial officer. Uh, the grounds person will just tell me to pull weeds. The maintenance person will tell me to change a light. And the financial officer will just tell me that I have $2,000 due next week. Um, all, of, all of those are the places I would want to avoid. The person that I would ask on how to make oatmeal cookies would be 
Like, Mrs. Allen made them. The person who made them, often Mrs. Allen, someone said the more generic word, which is the word I was looking for, the baker. Uh, the person who would bake the cookie. Because the person who created the cookie knows how he or she did it. So, what theistic evolution says is, how did God create the world? Let's ask man. And we'll see if we can figure out how God created the world. Rather, we ought to ask the creator. And the creator does a very good job through the origins account explaining how he created the world. But, let's say this answer is yes. Let's say... If the question is, did God create the universe through naturalistic process? Let's say you tend to believe yes, because I tend to believe yes for a long time. Um, if you think that theistic evolution is true, that is, everything about evolution is correct, just God was the starter, if you will. He basically was the fuse, boom, Big Bang started, and all the evolutionary processes took place, and is continuing. If you think that is true, then you have to make two assumptions that's inarguable. These assumptions have to be made in order for theistic evolution to be true, and you would have to hold true to these arguments or these assumptions if this is true. The first one is that evolutionary pronouncements or evolutionary statements will always trump biblical statements. That's the, that's the number one assumption that you're making. You're saying that whatever the Bible says is up for debate. It's, it, it is. Because the Bible and evolution, as we saw through evolution, the, the evolution week, and we saw through the creation week last week, um, evolution and the creation don't add up. It doesn't mesh. So what you have to say is that science is right, and God is either wrong or figurative. That's the assumption that you have to make, Joel. Yeah, so this opens up the door then for um, questioning everything else the Bible says. Exactly. So, if God is writing Genesis 1, and we read Genesis 1 as it is, uh, we come up with this idea that God created the world in six days, six literal days out of nothing, and he spoke things into existence. However, if you question Genesis 1, and if you question the origins account because it doesn't add up with evolution and you choose to open or be more open to the scientific facts, if you will, rather than the biblical statements, then what you're doing is you're going to look through the rest of the Bible and say, well, what does God mean about that? Is God literal about this? Is God serious about this? So the assumption that number one assumption that you're going to make is that evolutionary pronouncements have priority over biblical statements. And then the last thing if this is true, then you have, have to absolutely reinterpret the Bible when it does not add up to evolution. You have to change things. Where in the Bible does God say it took 13.8 billion years to create the world? Nowhere. So what do you have to do? Day cannot be literal. It has to be figurative. 13.8 uh, billion divided by six, that would mean day would be about 2.3 billion years. So in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was out form and void, um, and the darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. That literally took 2.3 billion years to do. That's the idea that you're going to have to have if you want to be fair, and if you want to accept theistic evolution. The Bible has to be reinterpreted because it doesn't align with evolution at all. So, if theistic evolution were true, we might end a little early today, awesome. If theistic evolution were true, then God, biblically, if we take the Bible for what it means, then God is wrong about a lot of things. One of the things that God is wrong about, if theistic evolution is true, God is wrong about the order in which things were created. If you think about it, and you chew on it, God is absolutely wrong about the order according to Genesis 1.1. So I like to take people here. They have the idea of the chicken versus the egg, which one came first. 
thing through science you can prove that it was a chicken but we won't get there that's not the sunday school topic today um i'd like to ask which came first the earth or the stars um if you study <clears throat> the biblical account which one of these two came first the earth or the stars in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth is the first thing that was created, or it, 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 well, the heavens and the earth was created, and then light on the first day as well. But we don't see stars created until day number four. Stars were created in day number four. So the earth came first. The stars were created alongside with the sun and the moon. If you take the Big Bang, if you take naturalistic evolution and have singularity, expand at a realm that is ridiculous to even track and you take all the evolutionary processes which one came first stars or the earth stars. evolution says stars came first if if you take theistic evolution to be true then god is already wrong in genesis 1 thus god cannot be trusted and the Bible is simply fallible. It's not credible. Because God says in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and he did create the stars, but it was after the earth was already formed. In, theistic, in evolution, stars was one of the first things that was created. The earth didn't come about till about 7 or 8 billion years after singularity exploded. And this is one of the issues that we're having. This is a piece that does not fit, because you, you have to take God's word for what it means, or you have to call God a liar in order for theistic evolution to be true. Yes, sir? Scientifically, the significance of the question is motion. In other words, if that was created first, then the motion would be, everything would be moving apart, mm -hmm. and the motion would be uh, the same direction. You know, but if God created the earth first, then he set it into yeah. motion. And then, that I mean, there's no other explanation for how planets can be spinning opposite directions. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, it's, it's such a vital question because it's a question of motion. Yeah. And if you, you know, it's a physical impossibility for that to have come along with that. In other words, the real question, I mean, the real answer is they wouldn't say, that the stars came first, they would say they came at the same time. Mm -hmm. They would be simultaneous, and then the Earth developed. Yes, evolved. yes, correct, correct. So, but the you know, but the end, the question is motion, right? Because it's such a contradiction for anyone who knows physics, physics and for motion sure. to contradict itself, correct. and the Earth contradicts the stars, right? Right, that is also true. Lee, and it's not just the presence of the Earth on for the stars, but I mean, there were several other things other than the presence of the earth. The dry land was created, mm -hmm. the plants were created all before the stars, and plants come way after stars in evolutionary. Completely after stars. Um, it's, it's, again, if you, if you study the, or, the order of how things were created, uh, you'd have to you'd have to switch things up, because again, stars were created in day four according to creation, but again, I guess if you want if you want to be more scientifically correct, just like Pastor said, the Earth would have pretty much been created at the same time. Just it evolved and informed it to the I guess they would call it a rock formation that it is now, uh, the large mass formation that it is. Cool. It was, it was now. Hot. It was yes, it was hot, and then it eventually cooled off and it created the Earth as it is uh, today. So that was a very good point from both of you, gentlemen. Thank you. So again, uh, if theistic evolution is true, then the Bible's wrong about the order of how things were created. Secondly, if theistic evolution is true, then God is wrong about the end of the world as well. Um, evolution will tell you that things are expanded. There's two ending theories of evolution. One is completely less popular than the other because it's unrealistic. Both are unrealistic. But one of the theories is that we're all getting better. We evolve into a being that is genetically more advanced than what we once were, and we're going to continue to do that until we basically become immortal or godlike creatures, if you will, and that will be our eternal existence. 
That's not the widely accepted one. The widely accepted one is the fact that because the universe is continuing to expand and evolution is continuing to, uh, ex um, uh, to happen, what's going to happen, and we're nowhere near, they say it's going to happen about two, three, four, five, six trillion years from now, but it's going to expand into a realm to where they call it the, the heat wipeout, which makes no sense because temperature drops. So everything's going to be too cold for us to inhabit the earth, elements is going to burn off, and basically, in about another three or four, six trillion years, uh, nothing's going to exist again. So we started with nothing. Everything's just going to eventually cool off after a very, very long period of time. I gave the example: if you took a hot balloon, of wa a hot water balloon, and you dropped it on the floor, the water expands. But when the water expands, the temperature drops. That's exactly what's happening to the universe, according to an evolutionist. Did you have a question? That's, um, wouldn't it be more logical that man would destroy the world before that would ever happen? With bombs and everything? Well, it, you're Charlie putting... Charlie had his way. If Charlie had his way. Uh, what, you're, what you're implementing is a, a, a moral figure to it. Cause like, it's that, not going to last. It's too localized, too. It's, it, I mean, yeah. what he's describing is on a grander on scale. A gra on a, a larger, larger scale. scale. Yeah, uh, exactly, on a universal scale. So... Whether the Earth exists in six trillion years or not doesn't matter in, in essence. Just the universe as we know it is going to basically freeze over and nothing else will exist after six trillion years so or so. So we couldn't even migrate to Mars or anything like that? Well, Mars would be in the universe. Yeah. I mean, we'd have, to, we'd have to find a way to create an, another dimension and go into that dimension and just inhabit for the rest of eternity. Dimension X. Dimension X. Um, now, in Revelation, we know that this isn't true because God's going to create a new world. Uh, he's going to create a new heaven and a new earth. And we are studying um, Revelation Sunday evenings at, at, um, here at church. Pastors, pastors going through that. And what we see is that after the rapture, God's going to destroy this earth. And he's going to create a new heaven and a new earth. And that's going to last for how long? It, it's it's not going to end. Uh, it's going to last forever. There's no end to it. And so if theistic evolution were true, if you were to hold the evolutionary processes, then God is wrong about the end of creation as well, or the end of the world as well. So again, God is wrong about the order. Theistic evolution is true. God is wrong about uh, how it ends. And then lastly, God would have to be figurative in the term six days. Um, Genesis 1, I know it's been a while, but uh, we're going to look at some of these verses where the word day is used. Uh, Genesis 1, let's look at verse number 5. And God called the light day, and God called the darkness night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. By the way, last week if you were here, I told you to pay attention to that term evening and morning. And, to, and just in a few minutes, I'll show you why those uh, two words are important. Verse 8. And God called the firmament in heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day. Verse number 13, and the evening and the morning were the third day. Uh, verse number 19, and the evening and the morning were the fourth day. Uh, again, we see it in verse number 23, and the evening and the morning were the fifth day. And then in verse number 31, and God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good, and the evening and the morning were the sixth day. So all six days we see God use this phrase evening and morning. But if evolution is true, we already talked about it, those 13.8 billion years, if God was referring, or God was using the word day, that day would probably have to be just over 2 billion years each. And that just doesn't add up to what scripture says. So if you study the word day, if you study what day means, it's, it doesn't lead for a figurative discussion. So, when you study Genesis 1 and you look at the word day, it comes from the Hebrew word yom. Uh, yom is the Hebrew word that's used for, for day. You'll find it about 2,000, I think it's 2,008 times uh, in the Bible. Anytime yom is used, it literally means 24-hour period. Uh, it does not give the example or it does not give the definition of a long period of time, how you and I would probably say like this day and age or back in my day. Uh, we're not talking about that. We're talking about a literal 24 hour period. Now this is why this is important. 
whenever, if you study Hebrew, if you study the syntax of it, whenever you see evening and morning together, it will never, ever mean anything outside of 24 hours. So you can literally read the idea um, that God is using evening and morning as 24 hours. And he says, uh, let's look at verse number 13, and the evening and morning were the third day. You can literally say, and the 24 hours were the third 24 hours. Essentially, get this idea. I created the world in six 24-hour periods, how you and I would determine day. And we, like I said, we see this um, about 2008 times, and it means... 24 hour period. There is a uh, famous evangelist, if you will, um, Dr. James Dobson. A lot of you may be familiar with him, who would 100% support the idea of theistic evolution. One of the reasons why he says theistic evolution is true is you can't, you have to take it figurative. Day couldn't have existed because the sun wasn't created until day number four. That's the larger moon, or the larger moon. That's the larger light to rule the day and the lesser moon, to, or the lesser light to rule the night. Sun wasn't created until day number four. So days one, two, and three literally have to be figurative. But on the contrary, God pretty much covers that as well. Look at verse number three. Uh, yeah, let's read from verse number three. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, and it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light... Day. God called the light day, and he called the darkness night. And then again, we see that reiteration in the evening and the morning. The 24-hour period were the first day. So God has that covered. He didn't need, he just, I guess, needed light, if you will. And he named that light day and the darkness night. And so, in order for theistic evolution to be true, we have, to call it, we have to call God a liar on so many different things. And when you call God a liar in Genesis 1, you have the ability to call God a liar in John 3.16. You have the ability to call God a liar in Romans. You have the ability to call God a liar in any portion of scripture you want because you can't take what he says literally, if this is true. And that, again, would have to be a faith in man. And so we ought to be very careful with these other ideas that we're coming up with, and it has to align with Scripture, because whenever we're wrong to Scripture, we don't adjust Scripture to us, we have to adjust to Scripture. So theistic evolution um, is, again, one of the top compromising theories that we'll discuss. The other two um, we'll talk about next week. That's the gap theory, uh, which, by the way, this is the one that's in your Bible, if you have a particular Bible, by the way, and um, we'll discuss that. And then real quickly, we'll go through progressive creationism, and then after that, if we have time, I'd like to show that video clip of a debate that um, I think you guys will find interesting. Any questions? Okay, you guys are, yes, sir? It's not really a question, it's more of a comment. So um, there's, there's, of course, a lot of other things that you could have mentioned as far as reasons why we should trust Genesis 1. Right. Um, one of the other things that I like to point out is uh, the instances where he says after his kind, mm -hmm. after after creating the plants, after creating the animals, yes. after creating the fish, mm -hmm. after creating the birds, he says after his kind. That's how things reproduce after their own kind. They don't turn into other kinds. They stay as the kind, and that specifically goes against everything in evolution. Absolutely. Um, you would have to create from one kind to another in evolu evolution. And, um, then people will ask, well, what about the, the global flood? You know, it wiped out all these animals, and you know if it, you know, two of each kind on this animal, well, again, they reproduce after their kind. He didn't bring a Chihuahua and a Labrador and um, a Great Dane. Uh, you know, he create. Yeah, he didn't uh, bring two species and created two, he brought two dogs, two cats, two horses, and through time, uh, and different variations of where they lived, if you will, and, and the climate of where they live, and micro, microbiology, if you will, um, microevolution, I'm sorry, um, 
then yeah, you get Great Danes and, and such. So that's a great point. Like that term. <laughs> speciation. Speciation would be a problem. That's that's, that's the term that. So you get a tiger and a lion just from it. If you get a couple house cats on board, you could eventually get the bigger cats. I I. Yes, I, you could. You so, could. So the two cats, yeah. two cat kinds that were on the ark had all of the genetic, genetic information of every cat kind we see today. Correct. Oh, yeah. Tigers, lions, bears, uh, house cats, <laughs> all Correct. of those. Bears. Correct. <laughs> Tony, do you have a question? No, I just want to say that one of the questions I always ask for the evolutionists is like, supposing the whole carbon dating and radioactive dating were accurate, which I don't think that it is, mm -hmm. but like, how could you even know what the atmosphere was like, you know, billions of years ago? To even, like, you're missing a factor, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's like you can't even test that. Yeah, it's not even possible. You're you're assuming that everything. Was, yeah, I, I would. I lose a couple of you guys each week. I would lose the entire class if I were to try to explain carbon dating. It's just, it's complicated, it's complicated and it's detailed and it is boring as I'll get out. Um, and it's boring for me to describe and it's also boring to listen to. But yeah, one of the things about carbon dating is you have to count the carbon-14 molecules that are in whatever's fossilized. And you have to assume that whatever happened eight, nine, 10, 15 million years ago um, is the exact type of atmosphere that we have today. And you can't. You can't. You have to make a lot of assumptions. You could more accurately assume it wasn't. Or accurate. Was that not? You could more accurately assume Correct. the atmosphere. You can actually, different. exactly. That would be a more accurate. You'd be assumption. able to actually prove more so that the atmosphere was different, <clears throat> even way back then. Because we didn't have TDIs. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Any other questions? OK. Um, I'll end it in prayer. Do you still want to start at 11? I mean, yeah. yes. OK. Church will start in seven minutes. Let's pray real quick. Father, we love you. I pray that you'll keep us safe today. Thank you for what we've learned. I pray that we'll be able to uh, apply what we've learned um, in our lives, the Lord, and have a better understanding on how you created everything. And Father, I just pray that you will be with uh, Pastor Price as he preaches in church and help that to go well, we ask in your name. Amen. Amen. All right.